All right. Acts chapter 26. Lord willing, we'll finish Acts uh, 26 today and then uh, possibly get into chapter 27 uh, if we have time. Uh, as I mentioned last week, the notes are on the back table. I mentioned it Wednesday night that I had put them out there. Wednesday night, the, uh, put the notes out there for Acts 27 and 28. All right. So Paul is standing before Agrippa. He's in the middle here, verse 19, of his defense to Agrippa. Keep in mind that uh, Festus has invited Agrippa and his wife Bernice to hear uh, Paul. And, uh, well, and for that matter, Agrippa specifically said, I, I want to hear him too. Uh, but certainly Festus doesn't know what to write to Caesar, and that's, that's kind of at the heart of all of this. And uh, as we discussed last week, uh, the idea behind Festus including Agrippa is twofold. For one thing, Agrippa having the background as a Jew might be able to shed some insight uh, into what he can write to Caesar. Secondly, it was mentioned also that perhaps or possibly there's a little bit of political gamesmanship going on here uh, in that when Festus writes to Caesar, he can include the fact that uh, Agrippa here has, has been with me in this process and here's what we have come to the conclusion of. So if, if there is blame to be had, it gets to be shared with Agrippa, so, and that's possible. Um, but uh, at the very least, he doesn't know what to write, and this is the official reason for Festus to have Agrippa here. So Paul, after he has finished his uh, recounting of his, the event on the road to Damascus, how that he saw this bright light, uh, he went into, uh, uh, went into Damascus, and of course we know how that he received information from Ananias to be saved. Uh, and in verse 19, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the re region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Uh, and of course, this is the second time that Paul has mentioned going to the Gentiles and teaching them regarding the truth. Earlier, this was mentioned in the vein of Jesus revealing to Paul that this is where he was going to send him. He was going to send him to the Gentiles. So keep in mind now, twice he's mentioned the Gentiles, and at the very least we know Agrippa and Bernice being Jews. They, they may have been the only ones there in the court proceeding that were Jews, but at the very least, uh, normally when Paul starts to even talk about the Gentiles, the, the Jewish people get all riled up, they get all upset. But Agrippa, and of course, given the fact that this is a Roman proceeding and not a Jewish one, even if Agrippa was inclined, which I don't think he was, but even if he had been inclined to uh, object to what Paul was saying, he's, I doubt he would do so in a Roman proceeding anyway. So in verse, uh, at the end of verse 20, we notice how that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. This go, falls right in line with what we talked about last week with John the Baptist and how that he also, when he was teaching to the Pharisees, when they came to be baptized of him and he told them, uh, he called them a brood of vipers, uh, he told them to go do works worthy of repentance, which was to say that they had the wrong motivation for having come to John in the first place. And Paul, of course, it's a different situation and certainly even a different law. John was teaching under the Old Testament still, uh, even though he was preparing the way for the Lord. Now Paul is on the New Testament. But notice the characteristic of people of faith that they prove their faith by their works. This, this falls right in line with James chapter 2. Okay, they, they prove their faith just like James describes himself. One will say, I have faith. The other says, I have works. Well, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Uh, and, and it falls right in line with how James brings up the example of Abraham, how that Abraham believed God's accounted him for righteousness, but James brings out the fact that he was willing to sacrifice his son and that this fulfilled that scripture. It fulfilled the, uh, the recognition of righteousness that God had placed on Abraham because of his belief that his works justified that faith and it showed it to be pure. And this is what Paul's uh, describing as having taught to the Gentiles, the fact that they should turn to God and do works befitting repentance. Change your life and, and let it be shown in your life. Verse 21, for these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Keep in mind, and of course, the way it's been framed under Festus, uh, we don't know exactly what the details were that the Jews uh, the words that they used or the way in which they recounted the events, but if it was similar or the same as what they said to Felix earlier in chapter 24, we know that they were attempting to make this a case simply about the Jewish law, 
they were trying to keep Rome out of the situation because they wanted Paul to themselves, and of course they want to kill him. So as Paul is defending specifically the accusations against him, and, and again, these are not, these aren't just the broad accusations. Keep in mind in chapter 24, when, uh, before Felix, they presented hearsay accusations. First of all, the people who claimed to have information that Paul had defiled the temple, they never showed up as far as we know. But even then, they assumed he did because Paul was walking around with Trophimus, not in the temple, but they assumed he took him into the temple. But then the accusations from the Jewish leaders were broader in the sense he's a troublemaker and he has these, uh, this sect of the, the Nazarenes is what they called them, and all of these broad accusations of character rather than a specific accusation of, of acts or, or work or event. So here in verse 21, Paul addresses the specific reason why he ended up here. And keep in mind, it's been two plus years since he first arrived in Caesarea. And so when he says, for these reasons, the Jews seized me, not because, and notice Paul says, this isn't really about Trophimus and, and the, the thought that, that perhaps he defiled the temple. Really what it boiled down to was, why did they come to that conclusion in the first place? Why did they jump to the conclusion when they saw Paul walking around with a Gentile? Why did they jump to that conclusion? Because they don't like Paul. Because they object to what Paul stands for and what he teaches. That's why. And that's what Paul really boils this down to. This isn't about their, their jumping to a conclusion about defiling the temple. This is about Christ and him crucified. They seized me in the temple. They tried to kill me. It's absolutely what happened. Not only did the mob attempt to do so, the Sanhedrin, or at least uh, Lysias, the commander, was afraid that, that the Sanhedrin would end up tearing him apart, even though the, the Pharisees were kind of on his side regarding the resurrection. He was afraid because of the tumult in the Sanhedrin, Paul would be torn apart. Uh, and then, of course, we have the whole uh, uh, threat of assassination, both before he left, which is what prompted his leaving at night, and even now, the plan is if Festus allows him to come back to Jerusalem, to kill him again. Whether Paul knows about that or, or suspects it, uh, he certainly is aware of what their intentions have been. Verse 22, therefore having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. So notice, notice to whom Paul gives the glory okay, and the credit. First of all, remember we talked about the providence when we were back in was it chapter 23 regarding this assassination attempt to Paul against Paul and how that his nephew just happened to hear about it and all those events that at no point does, it, does the scripture say that the Holy Spirit came to Paul's nephew uh, or, or that you know, somehow God literally took his nephew and put him in position to hear it. But providence works that way, doesn't it? And so when Paul describes having obtained help from God, not only in his being spared assassination in Jerusalem, but also in his safe arrival to Caesarea, his safety over the last two years in Caesarea, uh, and really you can go back further than that too. Uh, but he says, to this day I stand, suggesting he's always stood for Moses and the prophets. So, to this day I stand. This is, he has never left Moses and the prophets. And that's kind of what, to what Paul's speaking here in verse 22. I continue to stand for the same thing my father stood for. The law has changed, but that to which Moses and the prophets spoke, that which was to come, I stand with that. I stand for that, and I preach that. Witnessing both to small and great, and of course this speaks to, to just the, the lowliest of the multitudes, to the highest of authority, as in this case with Festus and with uh, Agrippa, uh, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said, which is to say if they're going to condemn me over things that I preach and teach, they're condemning Moses and the prophets too. And of course no Jew would ever uh, do that deliberately, but that's what Paul saying. Listen, I'm repeating the same things Moses said, the prophet said, and I'm actually detailing how these things have come about. Uh, the prophecies, how that Christ would suffer, how that Christ would have to die, the resurrection, all of that is what Moses and the prophet said was going to happen. And I'm just detailing that for everybody. 
verse 23, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Third time Paul's mentioned the Gentiles in context of the gospel being taught to them and them being part of the people of God. And of course, Paul is referencing prophecies of the Old Testament that the Jews certainly read or interpreted their own way. Okay, because in their minds, they were for the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through the Jewish people. When they would read prophecies regarding the Gentiles, they likely read it in such a way as to think, yes, the Gentiles can come through us. They can be made proselytes. And therefore, they have access into the promises of God. But they have to be, first become Jews. Okay? And, and of course, this, this whole uh, vein of thought is carried even later in the church with uh, the situation with the Galatians, even, and even back further in Acts chapter 15 before, where this thought process and teaching was you must become circumcised and then you can be baptized. Uh, it's as if the, 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 being a Jew was the gateway to being a Christian. And a lot of the Jews, that's how they viewed these prophecies regarding any of the Gentiles. But Paul says that Christ, that it was foretold he would suffer. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that the prophecies uh, detailed about Christ that came to pass. But Paul focuses on these because this is the focus of what he's telling Agrippa. He would suffer, implied that he would die because he would be the first to rise from the dead and never to die again. It's not to say Jesus was the first one to ever be raised from the dead. He was the first to ever be raised, never to die. And that's what Paul means here. And that he would proclaim light to the Jewish people, sure, but also to the Gentiles. And the same message to the Jews to come through Christ to God by remission of sins, that same message with no additions or subtractions will be given to the Gentiles. There's not going to be an added component for the Gentiles. You must be circumcised and then come to Christ for the remission of your sins. That, that's, that, it's the same message, both to the Jew and the Gentile. All right, so anything through uh, verse 19, verses 19 through 23, or for that matter, Paul's speech, defense, lesson, sermon, however you want to uh, word it. Here in verse 23, because verse 24, uh, Festus and, and Agrippa are going to start speaking. It's interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Did I hear somebody? It's interesting how much more detailed, or, or at least what we have record of, uh, regarding Paul's defense compared to Felix, and for that matter, Festus the first time. Uh, keep in mind, Felix and Festus, Felix would have had a little bit of background. He knew a little bit about uh, Jewish law. He knew a little bit about the way. His wife was a Jewess. Uh, so Felix had some background. But even when we read through chapter 24 and Paul's defense before Felix, Paul didn't get this detailed. Again, uh, assuming that everything we have uh, of what Paul told to Felix, that's, that's, that's what we have recorded, if that's the whole dialogue that existed between Paul and Felix in that moment. Uh, Festus, though, as far as what we can determine, Festus is kind of coming with a clean slate. He, he doesn't have any background. I mean, there, I'm sure there was some sort of a preparation pamphlet, tablet thing that, you know, Caesar gave to, to Festus or the government gave to Festus to kind of prepare him maybe. There may have been some sort of a, this is why we're, you know, we're sending you here to do this and maybe a little bit of background on the Jews. But in terms of their beliefs, their, their laws, Festus wouldn't have known any of this. This is part of the problem. Uh, so Paul, though, speak, being able to speak to a fellow Jew is why he's able to go into this detail. Festus wouldn't know a thing about any of this, about the prophets and about Moses. But Agrippa, really what Paul's speaking to, he's speaking to Agrippa and Bernice. I mean, he's already spoken to Festus. Most of this is going to be over Festus' head. But all of this is really aimed and geared towards Agrippa for the very purpose of what Agrippa himself is going to admit, that it seems as if Agrippa did believe. Okay, anything else through verse 23? Verse 24. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Which suggests to me that Paul was getting um, emphatic, not, not mean or angry, but his 
perhaps he was getting, what I might say, referred to, to preaching, getting into it, okay? And, you know, the thoughts were flowing, the emotions were flowing, and he's being emphatic in what he's saying. And it sounds like maybe that as Paul began, he kind of started uh, here, and then as he's building up, he's, his, his, his uh, outward uh, manifestation of how much he believes in this and so forth, it's, it's escalating as well. And so it sounds as if what happens here is Festus cuts him off. Paul may very well have intended to say some more stuff, but between verse 23 and 24, it sounds like Festus, he kind of stops him and says, Paul, you're, you're beside yourself, okay? And a lot of times this aspect of verse 24 is attributed to the content of what Paul's saying. And, and that very well could be regarding especially verse 23, that he would rise from the dead. And certainly that could also, in, in effect, offer that. But the fact that Festus said it with a loud voice, as if to, to kind of stop Paul for a moment, I, I tend to think that this is twofold. Yes, there is the content of the message that seems crazy, which is part of what Agrippa describes here, but there's also this conviction with which Paul spoke about it. Uh, it wasn't just the content, it was the presentation as well that I believe that, that Festus is speaking to here in verse 24. So when he says, much learning is driving you mad, you know, if, if Paul just said it kind of in a monotone, same type of, uh, of uh, way as he had said it, anything and everything else, it might not present the conviction that Paul had regarding the Christ being raised from the dead. So I kind of picture the two going hand in hand. Anything through verse 24? Uh, question three in our notes real quick. What did the prophets of Moses say would come? And, and of course, Paul doesn't get exhaustive here in what he describes, but certainly what does Paul describe to... Uh, Festus into Agrippa as Moses and the prophets speaking of. The Messiah. But interestingly enough, does Paul use the term Messiah? The Christ. Okay. And I, I personally believe that's deliberate for, for a couple of reasons, but perhaps the main one is, remember his audience. Okay. If he re referenced the idea of Messiah or deliverer, and any of the Romans present connected that with how that was typically interpreted by the Jews, which was a soldier king, warrior, who was going to cast Rome out of the land of Israel and reestablish the kingdom. They might misinterpret Paul's point. Okay, so I believe Paul very deliberately didn't use the phrase Messiah because he didn't want any kind of relation to uh, the idea of a, of a warrior king fighting against Rome. Paul didn't want that in the way. So he uses the term Christ. And Christ isn't a name. What is it? It's a title. What does Christ mean? <coughs> Sorry? Anointed. anointed, yeah. The anointed one. Okay. The chosen one. Uh, this is the one of promise. That is what Paul's emphasizing here. The one of promise. He doesn't want to to provide a term, not that Messiah wasn't accurate, it certainly is, but he didn't want to provide a term that might cause the Romans to kind of go, is he talking about kicking us out of, out of Israel and out of Judah? And, you know, so Paul uses the term Christ in verse 23. So yeah, the Christ is going to come. He mentions, and that's kind of the implied reference to prophecy in verse 23, that the Christ would suffer, which meant that the Christ had to come first. Okay, and of course, all that went with it, being born of a virgin, being born in Bethlehem, all that went with it. And then he would be the first to rise from the dead, never to die again, and that he would proclaim light. Okay, he would, of course, many of the references of the Old Testament refer to delivering the captives, which again went to the interpretation for the Jews the way they wanted to interpret it. But we know the captives of sin is what's being uh, mentioned. And of course, proclaiming light, understanding knowledge of how to be saved, all of that came from the Christ as well. Anything else through question three? Okay, verse 25. Paul answers and says, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. 
For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And what's interesting is that Paul kind of tips his hand here. And he seems to kind of make it obvious that the whole reason, or at least the specifics of, as it related to the Jews and the prophecies, this was for Agrippa's benefit. Okay, this is kind of the primary purpose for which Paul's going into the detail here. So when he says, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, okay, he's still acknowledging the authority of Festus. He's not buttering him up, as we would, you know, think of trying to, like a deceitfulness. There is an acknowledgement of authority from Paul. I speak the words of truth and reason. Given the content of his message and the conviction with which he delivered it, Paul says, I speak the words of truth and reason, which is the very thing that Festus seemed to be accusing Paul. Paul, this is unreasonable. <laughs> okay, you're getting, you're getting all uh, into yourself here, into what you're saying, but you're also describing resurrection from the dead and things that were said thousands of years earlier now come to pass. You're mad. And Paul says, no, I'm speaking reason. And of course, that reason is all based on the single, uh, a single belief, okay? What is that single belief? To say that Paul was speaking with reason depended on a single belief, and what was that? Not even, not even, that, not even that specific. Go back further. And not even that specific. Go back further. What would have been the main difference between Paul thinking he's reason versus Festus who believes Paul's mad? What is the main difference upon which Paul's saying, I speak with reason? Go back even further than Abraham. Go back even further than creation. Just the fact that God Almighty exists. That, that in and of itself. Because if God exists and he has given his word, then is there anything that is unreasonable in what Paul has said? If God, even through creation, implied what was going to happen, because we know that that God, referencing the idea of creation and Adam and Eve, God knew what was going to happen. He knew man would fall. There was a plan in place already at that point. And the writers of the New Testament go back to uh, Adam, they go back to creation, and with it carries the implication of what the Messiah was going to do. And as a result, when Paul says, I speak with reason, that's all on the fundamental basis that God exists. And that that God has told us what he was going to do, and he's done it. That's it. This is why you don't see Agrippa saying this. In fact, Agrippa's quite on the other side of the spectrum here. Because Agrippa does believe in God. But Festus, of course, Festus, he's got his gods, plural, the Roman pantheon. Uh, but this is what Paul's basing this on. It is within reason. If you believe there's a God, it's kind of like the, the six days of creation, right? Six, not seven, six. There are Christians who try to converge the six days of creation with, with what we've learned from science and saying, well, the six days of creation are really, you know, millions of years. Is it, if you believe in an almighty God, is it reasonable to believe in six days? Could God have created things to appear to be millions and billions of years old? Is that outside the realm of an almighty God? then why, bo- why bother working with all these you know, gymnastics trying to make the, the case, well, the Bible's not really literal in what it says there. And this is the same concept, is that if you believe in an almighty God, this is not a jump. In fact, if anything, uh, God raising people from the dead, I mean, remember what Jesus said regarding the healing of people, I think it was the, the paraplegic, when he says, uh, rise and walk, and they, the, the Jews were all upset that he said that, and or no, no, no. He said, uh, your sins be forgiven you first. And then the, the, the Jews were, were all confused and upset about that. And Jesus made the statement, what takes more power to say arise and walk or your sins be forgiven you? From a human perspective, you would think, well, to, 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 
heal a person and make them walk who's paraplegic. But what Jesus' point was that it takes more power to forgive sins. That's the true power of God. The physical stuff, I mean, that's child's play compared to what God's capable of. And so this concept of what is reasonable, raising somebody from the dead, that's not, that's nothing. God can do that. Anything else through verse 25 so far? And we already pretty much answered question four. Uh, it, the, uh, well, I'll, I'll read this. Why do you suppose Ephesus considered Paul had gone mad? Uh, I firmly believe it was this two-prong issue, not only of the content of his message, but the presentation of it as well. Paul's getting into it. He's showing his conviction and expressing belief in a resurrection from the dead, expressing the belief that prophecies made a thousand years ago have come to pass, and Festus thinks you're crazy. How, how is this? Why, why do you think this is reasonable? Anything else through verse 25? All right, verse 26. So when Paul describes, and this is, as he's addressing this, he's addressing the fact this is all reasonable. But then he basically speaks, this is the whole reason why Paul goes into this detail. For the king. Okay, so this is all based on what he said First in verse 25 to Festus, and he speaks about the king, Agrippa, when he says, I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his, he knows what I'm talking about. He knows about Christ, the, the, he knows about Jesus of Nazareth. This, is, these thing, this thing was not done in a corner, which is to say this was not some unknown, only a handful of people knew about it. Keep in mind, all of Jerusalem would have known about it. What else happened, especially when, especially when Jesus died? You remember what happened? What miracle took place when Jesus died that would have affected all of Jerusalem? Earthquake and it got dark. It got dark. The okay, the veil was written too. Of course, the earthquake. You know, if you were a if you were a skeptic, you could claim, well, yeah, but the earthquake that caused the thing to fall too, and and yeah, the sun darkened, it was an eclipse. The dead rose from the grave. Okay? And, and it doesn't say how many people and you know, exactly who all was affected by that, but you've got to figure that many of these dead who were faithful Jews, who were risen from the dead, imagine the impact that that would have had on people... You've been dead for six months. What, what, what gives? How, how come you're up and around and moving around? I, I don't know, you know if, if they were even aware of, of what had happened that caused them to be raised from the dead. But imagine, and, and, and not much is said about that in, in the Gospels or anywhere else for that matter. But imagine the impact that that would have had on the whole city of Jerusalem. I mean, if only, say, 50 people were raised from the dead. Now, I, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know how many people were raised from the dead. It could have been more. But imagine just 50 people and all the, the friends and family that those 50 people may have had and how that word would have spread. You know, employees or, or, or coworkers or, you know, friends that they had, acquaintances that found out they're, they're alive again now. This was not done in a corner, and that's Paul's point. People are aware of this, and Agrippa's aware of this. And as a result, when he says... He knows these things. I'm convinced none of this escapes his attention. He's fully aware. King Agrippa, now he addresses Agrippa directly. Do you believe the prophets? Not do you believe me. Okay? Not do you believe in Christ. Do you believe the prophets? And I love how Paul frames that because this goes back up to his statement that everything I'm, I'm doing, everything I'm teaching is no different than what Moses and the prophets taught and said. It's the exact same thing. So all of this then, Paul frames it in verse 27 as being not from, from Paul, but from Moses and the prophets. Do you believe in the prophets? I know that you do believe. Yes, ma'am. And I think from this we can draw the lesson that that's what we should do. Do you believe the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> Right. So the lesson for me is don't ask if they believe in God, ask if they believe in the Bible. Well, you know, John, at the end of his gospel, he would write many other things Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. 
that are not written. But these things are written. For what purpose? That you might believe, and believing you may have life in his name. Okay? You might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Ben? Three hundred thousand, yeah, three hundred thousand, but about three times more than normal the normal population. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, and and then people who did go back home after that, who went back of the dispersion, even if they didn't necessarily know much about the Messiah or or about Jesus of Nazareth, they certainly knew about the tumult. They knew about this fellow who had to be who, who was hung on the cross for the reason of and the way. Pilate insisted it remain king of the Jews. Not just that he claimed to be, although that's how the Jews looked at it, king of the Jews. You know, so certainly that would have stuck in a lot of people's minds. A lot, you know, this wouldn't necessarily have been something that you know, people just kind of ignored. This is certainly, especially in, the, in uh, the, the region of Judea, but even in the dispersion, like you said, because this was not done kind of in the dark of night. Okay, This was done... This was done before everybody with Roman involvement. Uh, Miss Snoopy. Yeah, my mind keeps going back to Jesus' resurrection and when Paul was talking about it. You know, the resurrections that are mentioned in the Bible, there was another person there, be it Jesus mm -hmm. or Peter or yeah, Paul or whoever. That's true. But his tomb was guarded and he left. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the, the, the Father, and of course Father, Holy Spirit, and Jesus, you know, the roles that they serve, every other time it's always been through some man in some form, right. But with Jesus, there was no man there to touch him, to heal him, to raise him from the dead. God did that through the Spirit and declared him, Romans chapter 1, verse 4, to be the Son of God through the resurrection. Uh, so yeah, you're right, There's, that's... that's that is a, a singular difference. Really, I guess you could make the case that really that's going to be true for everyone who was ever raised never to die again. Because, I mean, even at judgment, it's not like there's going to be some human there to, to raise us from the dead. It's going to be the power of God directly being, uh, raising people from the dead never to die again. Yeah. Anything else through verse 27? Question five, why did Paul ask Agrippa if he believed the prophets rather than asking if he believed in Jesus or the resurrection? And the way in which Paul has framed it as being about the fulfillment of the prophets. All of these events match exactly what the prophets said was going to happen. Maybe not the way the Jews had decided to interpret them, but these prophets and Moses, they spoke to what happened, and it did. And, not, and, and some people, oh, well, self-fulfilling prophecy. Did Jesus decide where to be born or how he was going to be born? Okay, so many of these, what people just kind of write off, oh, well, he was trying to be the Messiah, so he kind of just made it happen on his own. So many of this stuff was outside of Jesus' control. There was absolutely nothing Jesus as a man could have done to make it look like that he had fulfilled prophecy. It, it happened on its own. Uh, Neil? Yeah, Neil. Common ground. To build on where he can always lead back to the Bible, he can lead back to God. Absolutely. Um, and when you're talking to a person, if they don't, believe, they may believe in God, but not believe in the whole inspiration of the Bible. And so you have a whole different battle on your right. hands if they don't believe in the Bible. Then, then if they do believe in the Bible, you have a common ground to build on. Right. Absolutely. And, I, you know, and that, that is a common lesson, not only in the book of Acts, but in the letters of Paul and really throughout the New Testament, that you start where someone is. Okay? You can't start just where you're most comfortable. And I think that's kind of, a lot of times that's why we're afraid to talk to people, because we're afraid that wherever they are starting from may be an area that we're not really used to defending or, or used to explaining. 
and so maybe we tend to talk to people only if it's in an area that we're comfortable dealing with. But Paul, he became all things to all men. Okay? And really what that means is he, he attempted to find the, the common denominator. Where can we find common ground here? And with Agrippa, you know, Paul had already tried to talk to, to Festus. Uh, and with Agrippa, this is based in the law. That's why Paul frames it the way he does about, being, about, the Moses, about Moses and the prophets. Uh, Debbie? Well, and, and the, what, what gives substance to this, it's not just that Paul's saying this happened and there's no external correlation or evidence that it did. That it did. Paul says, listen, this didn't happen in a corner. Okay? There are not just one or two. There are multitudes of people who can attest, even now, 17 to 12, at this point, probably at least 20 years after the fact, uh, well, more than that, maybe about 25 after, since Jesus has been raised, after the fact, there are still people who remember, still people who know of this. And why in the world would so many thousands of Jews have turned from the law if this didn't actually happen? If, and if there wasn't actually evidence, people, eyewitness accounts who saw Jesus raised from the dead, 500 people at once Jesus appeared to after he was raised from the dead. People believed it because they had a reason to. There was evidence. It wasn't just a blind faith. And that's a part of what Paul's appealing to with Agrippa as well, is that this is not just some random, well, I'm going to make up this Jesus of Nazareth who's just going to happen to fit all the, the check boxes on the prophecies. That is not how it happened. This is a man who lived, who was human, who was flesh and blood, and then he was crucified and he was risen from the dead because he was Jesus, the Son of God. Anything else through verse 27? Yes, sir. You know, all those prophecies and stuff, they're very detailed. You know, that you could, Many of them are, yeah. You could, you could rule out a bunch of things. You know, oh, yeah. They're all verifiable. They're all, well, you know, they're all, you know, got little pieces that have to fit, you know, and Remember when we were going through our class in Psalms and we were looking at Psalms in the New Testament and how many of those Psalms you read through them and you just go, this is obviously talking about Jesus. I mean, right down to the soldiers casting lots for his garments. Do you think Jesus controlled that while he was hanging on the cross? Hey guys, why don't you, uh, why don't you start rolling some dice and see who's going to get my clothes? Jesus didn't do that. The soldiers did that on their own. God didn't force them to. This wasn't a predestination paradox thing. God simply knew what they were going to do. It's a difference. They chose to do it, but God knew way beforehand that's what was going to happen. And being hung on a cross, being uh, beaten by his stripes, we are healed. Uh, he uh, didn't offer a defense. All of that, so detailed in its uh, presentation of what the Messiah was going to accomplish through his suffering. Uh, it, it makes it impossible for it to have been by chance. Yeah. Anything else through verse 27 so far? Verse 28, Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. This is the basis of, our, well, several hymns, but the primary one, almost persuaded. Okay, Almost, but lost. All right? and, and, and kind of a key component here, especially with Paul's response, is almost persuaded enough? <clears throat> to me, the idea here of persuade or being persuaded, I, I look at Agrippa as being in the same boat as Felix, in that I believe Felix was convinced what Paul was saying was true, but he was not persuaded to act. And I believe Agrippa's in the same boat. I think that Agrippa really did believe what Paul was saying was true, but he was not persuaded to act. The term faith it carries with it the sense of conviction and therefore 
the motivation to act because of that conviction. Okay, Felix, he did believe, but he didn't have, it wasn't what we might phrase a saving faith in that he didn't allow that, that belief to spur him to act. And the same thing is happening here with Agrippa. I believe that he did believe what Paul was saying, that Paul made a, compo a compelling argument. And if it weren't for perhaps Agrippa's position, if it weren't for his status, his uh, wealth, and what he stood to lose if he did become a Christian, I, I mean, I know Luke doesn't go into detail here as, why, as to why Agrippa decided he, didn't, he wasn't going to be or what you know, caused him to say, no, I, I'm not going to, but almost, I, I tend to think that probably was a primary reason of what he stood to lose. But even this public acknowledgement, you, you, you've, I mean, it's almost like you've convinced me what you're saying is, is right, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Drinking, Absolutely. That is perhaps the major stumbling block. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, there is a cost. Yeah, yeah, change. Yep. All right, we'll stop there with verse 28. We will pick up and finish chapter 26 and get into chapter 27 next week. Thank you, everybody, for the thoughts and comments.